Good afternoon and welcome to our Cryogenic Sensors 101 webinar. My name is James Francis. I'm a multimedia specialist here at Lakeshore Cryotronics. And I'm here with Scott Quartz, who is a scientist and metrologist here at Lakeshore, along with Christine Schiffman, who's our quality engineer. And so today we're going to discuss cryogenic sensor technology and its applications. Thank you guys for joining us. So tell me, Scott and Christine, why does the field of sensor technology interest you? I find it interesting because it's an enabling technology. Uh, people have the idea that cryogenics is only in university labs, but it's actually used all around us, whether it's in food processing, whether it's in medical applications with MRI machines. Uh, it's also used in defense, it's used in space exploration, and even CERN, when you look at the discovery of the Higgs boson most recently, it's not really just a university setting or an R&D lab anymore. It really is all around us. So cryogenic temperature sensing, to me, it's an enabling technology that feeds into all of these fields. And uh, you know, I've, I've always found you know the uh, the arena of material properties interesting. That's that's my background, and not only being able to study material properties with the sensors, but actually the knowledge of material properties required to manufacture the sensors and, and work with them to you know do things like improving the accuracy, the reliability, and the behavior of them is, uh, is what I really enjoy about it. So when it comes to selecting sensors for cryogenics, what are some things to consider? Well, if we go to the slide that we have, you can see that when you are putting together a cryogenic, let's back up, okay. When you're putting together a cryogenic experiment, you're really trying to separate lots of different effects. And the effects really play into one another. The thermal effects that you have from heat leak into the system, that looks like a temperature shift. Heat leak down the electrical leads connecting to the sensor, they really look like um, a temperature shift as well. So in the design considerations, you have to figure out how to limit the outside world's influence into your system. And a lot of times it's very tricky. So with design considerations, you really work to minimize interaction between these different physical effects. There's also the considerations of, you know, your actual environment of what you're testing. What space do you have? How are you going to mount the sensor? So if you have a nice flat surface, are you going to mount the sensor directly? Do you need it in something like a, uh, a bobbin to be able to mount it in, for heat sinking? Or are your space considerations such that you need a very, very small sensor? Or perhaps uh, you know, we have configurations that are more cylindrical for uh, uh, placing inside various environments. So those are also important considerations uh, which are going to affect how you're able to measure the temperature and what kind of accuracy you're going to be able to have. So in sensor and temperature measurements, we see references to primary thermometers and secondary thermometers. What are the differences and into which category do sensors fall? When you look at primary thermometers, that's a class of thermometers where physically we understand everything that's going on in the process. When you look at doing calibrations on thermometry, it really is a chain that starts with national standards labs. And the National Standards Lab do maintain what we call primary thermometers. One example would be a constant gas vapor thermometer, where you're basically using the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, with some corrections. But you're measuring pressure and relating that to temperature. And you can do that directly. But most primary thermometers are very bulky. They're very slow. They're a project unto themselves. They're, they're very hard to use. And when companies like Lakeshore, when we sent thermometers to a national lab to be calibrated, the national lab isn't using the primary thermometers. They're actually using a set of secondary thermometers that they maintain. And by using the secondary thermometers, they calibrate the thermometers that we bring back to Lakeshore. We use those to calibrate working standards, which are used day to day. And then finally, we calibrate secondary thermometers that we sell to customers from those. So that maintains the complete traceability back to a national laboratory and back to, to what we would call natural standards for thermometry. So all of the thermometers that we sell are secondary thermometers. And all that really means is 
the secondary thermometer is something where you can't, can't write down a complete equation, so you can't describe it in physical terms completely. Okay, and as for the sensors themselves, what needs to be considered for specific applications? Uh, well, the um, the material that uh, it's made out of. So again, originally, you know, we had uh, platinum and germanium sensors, and those being pure materials, uh, they're very accurate, but they have a, a shorter temperature range. So one of the questions you need to ask yourself is what kind of one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is what kind of range you're trying to go for. Are you looking for a very narrow range? In which case, uh, the sensors like germanium and platinum, those work uh, really well. Uh, if you're looking for a wider range, however, you might want to go with uh, diodes, which have some of the best accuracy over a much wider range, uh, anywhere from uh, something like, you know, uh, down in, in the low Kelvins to up to like 500 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Um, however, those have problems with the magnet, with magnetic fields and with radiation. They do not function very well in that range. So, if you're asked, if you have various uh, issues, like you're working in uh, uh, more uh, uh, stressful environments, such as radiation or magnetic fields, we have the, uh, the Cernox sensor, uh, which uh, is is much less susceptible to magnetic fields and, and radiation, and and still has good accuracy over the wide temperature. Range so definitely your environment and then your temperature range are going to be some of the most important considerations. So when looking at the various physical designs of sensors, say Cernox, rocks, diodes, we see that their physical characteristics of the design are different. What are some of the reasons for the differences in the design? The well, there are two answers to that question. One is when you look at the sensor itself. You're really looking at the sensor material as a sensing property. So the behavior of, say, a diode, a semiconductor, is much different than the behavior of, say, a platinum wire-wound sensor. Um, so part of the part of the answer lies in the material property itself, its inherent property. And then secondary, depending on how you have to package that material. So when you look at a platinum wire-wound sensor. You can kind of think of a slinky that's encapsulated inside a ceramic tube. When you look at a diode, typically it's a very thin silicon substrate that has a diode that's fabricated into it, maybe eight thousandths of an inch thick. So the packaging really reflects what you have to have in terms of the sensor requirement. Some types of sensors actually require that there's no strain in the mounting because the strain will change with temperature as things contract and expand. So the sensor is mounted inside a package and it's really suspended just by the electrical leads. So all of those come into play as to how we package the sensors. And then on top of that, we have a number of adapters that really just facilitate the way that a customer can take the sensor and easily mount it in their experiment. Okay, so you just mentioned diodes and platinum sensors. What other types of sensors are available? Um, in the past, it was very common that you would use a germanium thermometer in conjunction with a platinum thermometer. These days, that combination has been replaced mostly by diodes and by Cernox, which are both wide range sensors. When you start getting below one Kelvin, you still see a number of germanium sensors being used. Uh, and that's something that, that dates back to the early 60s. Uh, germanium was a secondary standard. It was used by a number of national standards labs, and it was used in developing one of the temperature scales in 1976. Ruthenium oxide, its main use is going to be below 1 Kelvin. There are people who can use it all the way down to about 10 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, there are some other specialized types of sensors, including thermocouples where you take two dissimilar metals and you make a junction with them. And that junction develops a voltage as the other two ends, the two loose ends, are held at a different temperature. So some of the thermocouple materials can be used down as low as about 4 Kelvin. Some of the materials can be used up as high as about um, 1100 Celsius, and some even higher than that. But there are only a few that really can work from cryogenic to very high temperatures. And then one of the, the last sort of 
uh, a very unique sensor is this capacitance sensor. Capacitors are really useful in very high magnetic fields because they really don't have much of an offset because of magnetic fields. They're fairly independent. They have their own problem because typically they are a dielectric type glass and that dielectric glass just from the, the, the properties that the material has inherently, they drift with time. So every time you thermally shock it, it takes maybe hours to days to come into equilibrium and the calibration will shift with every thermal cycle. So they're not used very often. And when they are used, it's almost exclusively magnetic fields. Okay, so then to narrow down the discussion to say specific end user applications, what would be the kind of sensors used in universities and research labs? Uh, well, um, a lot of the, uh, the research, uh, they use a lot of actually the, the bare sensors, so that's actually just the uh, sensor with some gold, lead, gold leads attached to it uh, that they actually mount directly to what, a, what, what it is that they're studying. Uh, also use a lot of, uh, one of the very popular sensors uh, is the uh, what we call the CU sensor, so it's actually mounted in a bobbin. The sensor is on a copper bobbin with uh, special epoxy that's at, used at cryogenic temperatures, and that allows a lot of flexibility in how it's mounted uh, for a lot of different applications uh, because it's, it's a lot easier to mount in terms of it just takes a, a, you know, bolting it to the surface as opposed to having to use special pacer or epoxy specifically. Okay, and what about for materials research and semiconductor research? The, the types of materials research that goes on right now, it, it spans a very wide temperature range. If you're looking at magnetic properties of hard drive materials, you may want to go to very high temperatures as well as room temperature and below. But, and a lot of R&D applications, you're really looking at material properties at, say, 4 Kelvin and below, say, on dilution refrigerators. So when you're looking for those types of properties, probably above 1 Kelvin, people are mostly using diodes and Cernox. Once you start going below 1 Kelvin, the, the most likely combination probably would be rocks, which is ruthenium oxide, and then Cernox materials. Uh, you see very few people using germanium in that range these days. Okay, and as for, say, low temperature applications and manufacturing, what would be some of the types of sensors used for those applications? By and large, for manufacturing, if you're looking at processes like gas liquefaction, uh, if you're looking at MRI-type machines, which is medical application, prior preservation, many people if you're staying above 70 Kelvin, and that's sort of the break point, 70 Kelvin and above, you typically have people using diodes and platinum wire wound type resistors. They're fairly cheap. They're very easy to use. Once you start going below 70 Kelvin, diodes and Cernox are by far the most common sensors that are being used. Great. So once a sensor is selected, what are some things to keep in mind to ensure that the sensor performs as outlined in the specs? Definitely uh, one of the important things is how you've attached the wires to, to whatever. Uh, so you've attached the sensor, you've mounted the sensor to your equipment, but a, a big source of error in, in sensing, the temperature can come from uh, the wires if they're not properly heat sunk. So heat can travel up the wires. Uh, if, especially if the wires are exposed to an outside environment. So proper mounting of the wires is, is, is very, very important. In addition to uh, how the wires are configured, uh, making sure they're not causing their own electrical interference, depending on what kind of wire type that you have. What are some common applications where sensor performance in the presence of radiation is a concern? And what types of sensors work best for these applications? Well, Ms. Common applications where you would have radiation involved would be either space or in an accelerator type of facility. So when you look at satellites in space, depending upon where they're located, you have different amounts and different types of radiation. Um, on Earth, if you look at accelerator facilities, one of the, the large installations right now is CERN, which is doing research and discovering elementary particles. 
And CERN's been in the news most recently in the last year for having discovered the Higgs boson, which we've been looking for for nearly 50 years. Um, in those types of situations, the types of sensors that you really want to look for are sensors which typically are fairly pure metallic type materials. So platinum is very good, rhodium iron is very good, or you're looking for sensors that are fairly amorphous and reasonably low resistance. Uh, Cernox is a very good example. If you have complicated structures like a semiconductor device, diodes and transistors, they have many oxide layers in the construction. And those oxide layers will tend to charge and they'll shift the calibration. And that leads to an error that, that, that really is sort of a permanent shift. It may vary with temperature, but it doesn't go away. What type of wiring works best for sensor leads in very low temperature applications? Well, talking about, you know, as we talked about the importance of heat sinking the wire because heat can travel along the wire. Uh, very popular uh, wire to use in, in the cryogenic sensors is uh, phosphor bronze. There's also constantan and uh, manganin. Those are all basically impure materials. So when, when most people think of electronics, they think copper is a popular one, but that's very pure material. So it actually allows a lot of thermal conductivity. So any heat that's exposed from an outside environment is going to travel up that wire and the sensor is going to start detecting that temperature as well as the actual environment that you are trying to measure. So if, you're, if your wires are being exposed to an ambient or an outside environment outside of what you're trying to measure, Definitely the impure materials such as, you know, phosphor bronze is a very popular one that, that we use and, and manganin. Um, one point is, though, if your wires are actually going to be inside your environment, like inside a cryostat, then actually using copper is beneficial because then it actually um, allows the, uh, the wire actually interacts, which is what you want with your, with your uh, cryogenic environment. And there the uh, conductivity uh, is helpful because it, it all becomes, it all equilibriates into, into that environment and actually can prevent noise. So again, it kind of comes down to what environment you're looking at and uh, what your application is. Okay. If I can add one thing there. I'm sorry. I was just going to point out that really the cryogenic wires that people tend to use are things like phosphor bronze, manganin, constatan, stainless steel. They have lots of impurities added to them, so if heat doesn't travel along the length very well. But at the same time, they have a very high electrical resistivity. So using those types of wires in a heater circuit, where you're actually trying to control temperature and you're using a temperature controller to send heat into your system, the wire will distribute heat along its length. And quite often, people will use uh, a copper wire for the electrical circuit for the heater simply because they want to dump all of the heat where the heater is located and not along the connecting leads. If you're in an area with a lot of RFI or EMI interference, say in an industrial setting, what kinds of things can be done to prevent the interference from causing problems with the measurements? Really that goes to the installation of the sensor. It's not so much the sensor itself. There are things that you can do to try and reduce or eliminate the effects of the RFI or the EMI. And those include things like using twisted pair, using shields over the cable. The, the sensor itself really, for the most part, is not picking up that interference. Real, it's really the electrical connection going to it. And if you're using a doer, these days almost all doers are metal, aluminum or stainless steel. Uh, those actually are pretty good Faraday cages. They actually keep that type of interference out of them. So the thing you have to do is make sure that the wire that's external to the doer, that that wire is actually shielded properly, the shields are grounded properly, and you don't have multiple grounds. Great. So what are some common misconceptions about cryogenic sensors? Uh, well, one of the misconceptions may be about the uh, fragility of the sensors. So uh, they're actually uh, uh, fairly robust and um, uh, very useful in, you know, in applications where you might be concerned that uh, you need you know, lots of special protection, but especially our SD package, which is also a hermetic package. It's, it's a hermetic ceramic package and actually has 
a good amount of, of strength and endurance in, in some typically nasty environments as well. So. That's sort of going on with that. Over the past several years, we've sold a number of sensors to aerospace companies and, and NASA directly that are going into space. And for those applications, you really want to make sure that the sensors are going to be robust, they're going to last a long time. And as part of that effort, we have groups of sensors that we've tested. Uh, maybe we've done thermal shocking from room temperature to liquid nitrogen 2,000 times, or we've sent them off for very high levels of vibration testing and mechanical shock. They actually have sensors that I've kept for 20 years, recalibrating them every few years because when you think about applications like James Webb, NASA has been buying sensors for that application for probably 10 years, and we're still not going to launch for three or four more years. So the question becomes, you have these sensors that you bought five years ago, but they're installed on the system, it's going into space, but what happens if it sits on the launch pad for five years, or it sits in the facility where everything is being assembled for five years? So we do types of testing to ensure reliability and to kind of ensure robustness and make sure that they have every confidence that when they, they shoot this off into space, that they're going to continue to work for another 20 or 30 years. And what would you say is the single greatest contributor to sensor error? A lot of it can, as, as we've kind of talked about, come down to the setup. So, you know, we do everything that we can to ensure the highest reliability and accuracy. Uh, Scott mentioned a lot of the testing that we do for, for NASA. So we go through and make sure that, that there are basically, you know, zero defects in, in our work and that they, they can be counted on. But again, that is just the sensor and in and of itself, it is not necessarily the whole answer. So making sure you have the right setup, making sure you have, again, you understand your environment, you have the right uh, mounting to what it is that you're trying to measure, the proper wire installation, and um, just ensuring that it's actually, it's part of your experiment and that it meld, melds well into your experiment um, is, is probably going to be the, the best way to ensure you're going to get the best uh, measurements out of it. And, and we kind of think of the errors that users have falling into three categories. And one of them is the installation. Did you use four leads instead of two leads to install the sensor? Have you placed it in the right position for your experiment? Um, did you use thermal grease when you mounted the sensor so you have good thermal connection to the experiment? Did you heat sink the leads to prevent heat from leaking into the sensor from the environment? Uh, all of this sort of relate to the installation of the sensor. You get beyond that to the actual operation of the sensor. Are you using the correct excitation level? A again, if you put too much power in, the sensor will heat up itself. And as far as you're concerned, that looks like a temperature difference. And you can't tell the difference between that and a real temperature difference in the experiment. Uh, are you performing current reversal, which gets rid of what we call thermal EMS, which relates back to that thermocouple effect. Um, so there, there are those sets of errors that are in operation. And then the last one I would say would be environmental. Are you in a magnetic field? Are you in a radiation environment? Both of those can create offsets in the sensor, which again, are very difficult sometimes to distinguish between a real change in temperature. So because there are all those factors, then really the, the biggest thing is truly understanding your experiment. You know, we have such a wide range of sensors. We have, you know, maybe just maybe a hundred different choices in terms of what wire you use, what package you use, what sensor you use. And all that, again, comes down to understanding exactly what you need in your experiment. Not all sensors are the same. They don't all just measure temperature. They often are expecting a very particular setup. So understanding that and getting the right sensor for your application is, is going to be a big is going to be a big factor. We we often talk about temperature and the ability to measure it being an enabling technology just in a lot of different fields. But because of that, sometimes it's very easy to purchase this black box type item, you install it, you operate it, without really having a good understanding of, of what what it's really measuring. And th there's nothing that takes the place of having experience and understanding of what 
the sensor and the instrument are actually doing. Excellent. So to kind of end our discussion, uh, I'd like to ask a more broad or general question. In this era where there's a push to encourage students to enter the fields of science and technology, what is Lakeshore doing to support students and promote the fields of science and technology as a career choice? Well, one of the, one of the things uh, that we do yearly that, that I really enjoy and have, have always participated in is called our Student Day, where we actually invite, what, like 80 to 100 uh, high school students from various high schools in the area. They actually come in for the whole day, and we have uh, a lot of stations set up around the facility going through our entire business from sensors to instruments and, and all the different areas, talking about first what Lakeshore does in terms of you know, our manufacturing, our research, and getting them interested in the kind of research, in fact, that even our customers are doing and using our instruments for. But we also like to branch out into other areas. So we do often demonstrations of you know, general material properties, light, energy, magnetics, just trying to show them, you know, what it's what it's like working in the field of, of science, and hopefully they can see, you know, this is actually what they're doing during the day as an engineer, as a scientist, and uh, encourage them to uh, to maybe want to pursue that as their own field. So it's again, it's a whole day activity, and it's it's a lot of fun. They cycle through all the stations. They get to kind of see some hands-on stuff, and uh, yeah, I really enjoy that part of it. And I have a personal interest in this myself because I have 12-year-old twins. And I have to say that over the past, you know, certainly seven or eight years, doing scientific experiments with them has just been a joy. And I've been able, with Lakeshore support, to go to some of the elementary schools in the area and do experiments on cryogenics, on light, on energy, on sound. And when you have the kids who are young and they see something that they like, something that really that's sort of neat and novel. They're not afraid to say, wow, look at that. That is cool. You know, you, as you get older, kids, seem, I don't know why, they tend to lose that, that ability to let themselves be impressed by something. Maybe it's not cool. But if you catch the kids when they're young, maybe you can help them keep that sense of, of awe and wonder and think, well, science isn't boring. I mean, and, and I got to tell you, anything that explodes, makes loud noise, catches fire, that's a winner when you're doing demonstrations with kids. They're not afraid to come up and volunteer and be part of the experiment. And Lakeshore has done a, a fantastic job in supporting that effort here in West Ball. We also, a couple times a year, have several uh, people from Lakeshore volunteer to do uh, judging for science fairs around the area. So we go to the different schools and and participate in, in their programs uh, for encouraging the kids in the, in the science field with, with things like fairs and, and presentations. Great. Thank you both. And Scott, I have to say, I've personally seen your making ice cream with liquid nitrogen lesson. And it's definitely inspiring and engaging with the students and delicious as well. So if the viewers have any other questions, how can they contact? Probably the best way would be by email. My email address is scourts at lakeshore.com, or they can call area code 614-891-2243. I'm at extension 150. And uh, my email address, of course, anyone can, can reach me. My email address, a little bit longer, but it's uh, Christine, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, dot Schiffman, S-H-I-F-F-M-A-N, at lakeshore.com. And my phone number also, I can, you know, be reached anytime, 614-891-2243, uh, extension 189. Well, I'd like to thank the viewers for joining us, and a big thanks to Scott and Christine. Here in a second, across the screen, you'll have the opportunity to enter your email address and sign up for our quarterly cryogenics newsletter, which contains pertinent cryogenics information and news. And be sure to visit our YouTube channel for more interesting and educational videos just like this one.